In October of 1978, while working as a simple laborer at a beer brewery in Trutnov, Czechoslovakia, a blacklisted playwright by the name of Václav Havel would illegally publish a short 80-page essay about the political situation in Czechoslovakia and many other countries around the world. Seven months later, Havel would be imprisoned. Ten years after that, Havel would become president of Czechoslovakia, in part because of the short essay he had written over a decade prior. Titled The Power of the Powerless, Havel's 80-page essay remains to this day extremely unknown to the world outside of the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and a few other select ex-Warsaw Pact countries, yet in many ways is more pertinent than ever. Why, you might ask? Well because it asks one basic yet extremely important question. How much power do we have as a community, as a distinct group, and even as individuals? In a society, and even greater than that, a world where one may feel utterly powerless. Is that belief really true? In the face of a society in which Havel found himself censored and without an official way to voice opposition, within the legal and political structures of the day, Havel chose to instead question the very nature of power and authority within human society. What exactly is such an opposition within the framework of this system? What does it do? What role does it play in society? What are its hopes, and on what are they based? Is it within the power of the dissidents, as a category of sub-citizen outside the power establishment, to have any influence at all on society and the social system? Can they actually change anything? The powerless can only begin with an examination of the nature of power and the circumstances in which these powerless people operate. A decade before Havel wrote The Power of the Powerless, Czechoslovakia had experienced a short period of wide-sweeping reforms under the tutelage of the first secretary of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia, Alexander Dubček. Referred to as the Prague Spring, Dubček introduced reforms to the communist government who had ruled the country since 1948, gradually decentralizing the economy, granting citizens additional rights, easing censorship, and democratizing the political structures within the country, which indirectly loosened the communist party's grip on the social, economic, and political aspects of society. During this brief period in the late 1960s, the so-called Czech New Wave appeared, in which filmmakers, writers, and other artists flourished, releasing films, books, and plays that previously would have never passed censor boards. Havel, who had already had difficulty having his plays performed in the country, quickly latched on to the reforms, believing that they would finally allow him to properly pursue his career as a playwright. However, Dubček's attempt to create socialism with a human face would be short-lived, as only eight months after becoming first secretary of the Communist Party, the Soviet leadership, headed by Leonid Brezhnev, would order fellow Warsaw Pact countries to invade and occupy Czechoslovakia in the August of 1968, eventually forcing both Dubček and fellow reformers within the party to resign in 1969. Although the Czechoslovak military and people did not violently resist the invasion, except for a few isolated incidents, many citizens were still amazed by the brutality their fellow Warsaw Pact allies displayed during the invasion and subsequent occupation. After the resignation of Dubček and his replacement with the more cooperative Gustav Husak, Czechoslovakia would enter a period referred to as normalization, where most of the reforms introduced by Dubček would be rolled back and the country normalized to its pre-Prague Spring self. However, the country not only normalized to its prior state, but many of the existing political institutions were strengthened and embedded even further into everyday life so as to avoid reforms appearing again in the future. Now exiled from the theater as a result of normalization, Havel would go on to describe the new power structure in Czechoslovakia. Our system is most frequently characterized as a dictatorship or more precisely as the dictatorship of a political bureaucracy over a society which has undergone economic and social leveling. I am afraid that the term dictatorship 
regardless of how intelligible it may otherwise be, tends to obscure rather than clarify the real nature of power in this system. Havel refers to the system present in Czechoslovakia as post-totalitarian, something that exists outside of the traditional political dichotomy. I am fully aware that this is perhaps not the most precise term, but I am unable to think of a better one. I do not wish to imply by the prefix post that the system is no longer totalitarian. On the contrary, I mean that it is totalitarian in a way fundamentally different from classical dictatorships different from totalitarianism as we usually understand it. To clarify what he means by the term post-totalitarian, Havel uses the example of a green grocer putting a sign with the slogan, Workers of the World, Unite, in the window of his shop. Why does he do it? What is he trying to communicate to the world? Is he genuinely enthusiastic about the idea of unity among the workers of the world? I think it can be safely assumed that the overwhelming majority of shopkeepers never think about the slogans they put in their windows, nor do they use them to express their real opinions. He put them all into the window simply because it has been done that way for years. Because everyone does it, and because that is the way it has to be. If he were to refuse, there could be trouble. He could be reproached for not having the proper decoration in his window. Someone might even accuse him of disloyalty. He does it because these things must be done, if one is to get along in life. The post-totalitarian system demands conformity, uniformity, and discipline. For this reason, however, people must live within a lie. They need not accept the lie. It is enough for them to have accepted their life with it and in it. For by this very fact, individuals confirm the system, fulfill the system, make the system, are the system. A post-totalitarian society, like Czechoslovakia and many other countries around the world at the time, exists around the rituals of power individuals at all levels of society must follow in order to guarantee their survival within the system. The whole power structure could not exist at all if there were not a certain metaphysical order binding all its components together, interconnecting them and subordinating them to a uniform method of accountability, supplying the combined operation of all these components with certain regulations, limitations, and legalities. Human beings are compelled to live within a lie, but they can be compelled to do so only because they are in fact capable of living in this way. If the main pillar of the system is living a lie, then it is not surprising that the fundamental threat to it is living the truth. When living within an unjust and abusive power structure, especially within one where the individual has no official capacity to challenge it, the greatest tool the individual has to oppose the structure is the ability to live in the truth. What does Havel mean by living in the truth, though? It entails living a life of free expression and action, one in which people choose to pursue betterment of themselves, their workplaces, and communities, engaging not only in political activities, but also in regular daily life. Activities that have no direct political involvement, and what Havel describes as pre-political activities. Every free expression of life indirectly threatens the post-totalitarian system politically, including forms of expression to which, in other social systems, no one would attribute any potential political significance not to mention explosive power. When discussing these pre-political activities and their impact, Havel mentions the concept of small-scale work, a concept Czechoslovak politician Tomáš Masaryk introduced when he campaigned for Czechoslovak independence from Austria-Hungary before World War I. This concept of small-scale work reveals that if you want to change something within a power structure, or improve that power structure, there are all kinds of things one can do outside of the political sphere to work towards those goals. But still, what does living within the truth mean in practice? In reality, how do I bring about change? How do I assert my own power? Well, here's what you and anybody else can do. Be a good person. Be respectful. Be kind. Be caring. Treat others as you would treat yourself. Strive to improve yourself. Something like this may seem exceedingly trite and ineffective, but it is an essential fundamental to any further actions. Just as a high-quality machine is constructed out of high-quality parts, 
A society is organized and composed of people. So the better the people who make it up, the better the society. Be genuine in your actions and words. Ask yourself if you agree and believe in what you say and do. Ask if these things embody your true self or if they hide and suppress it. Be constructive in your work and aim for excellence in your actions. Havel describes an example of this when he talks of a brewer at a brewery who genuinely wanted to craft the best beer he possibly could. However, by endeavoring towards this, it resulted in his dismissal from his position by a disinterested higher-up for unsaid political reasons. The brewer, unsuccessful in achieving his goals, still, however, challenged the power structure and chipped away at its authority through a non-political action, simply by taking pride in his work, by caring about the things you do, by doing the best you can. You are asserting your own power within a structure that doesn't want you to assert it. Be the change you want to see. I know it's a banal saying, but it has worth. If you dislike the actions of a business, join that business and work within it to change it. Or start your own rival business to challenge it and highlight the original business's faults. If there are people going hungry in your community, start a food bank or work for an existing one. Instead of just seeking out political action to address a problem, look for other ways outside of the political system and power structure through which you can make an impact. Why solely rely on a potentially inept and corrupt power structure to address problems when regular people can address them themselves in a potentially more effective way? Political action within a power structure still has an impact, but when paired with practical, pre-political actions, it's only strengthened. Create parallel structures. As Havel says, when those who have decided to live within the truth have been denied any direct influence on the existing social structures, not to mention the opportunity to participate in them, and when these people begin to create what I have called the independent life of society, this independent life begins, of itself, to become structured in a certain way. If you feel you have little to no power within an organization or structure, then form a parallel group with other people who live within the truth and seek similar goals. Feel ineffectual in your trade union? Create a parallel one. Feel ineffectual in your local civic group? Create a different one. Feel dissatisfied with your local media outlet? Form a parallel one. Feel excluded from the prevailing culture? Found a new one. Whether it's information networks, education, foreign interactions, or even micro-economies, parallel structures amalgamate over time into a parallel society, and beyond that, into a parallel polis, establishing real, effective power from the bottom up that the traditional power structure will be forced to interact with at some point. But the formation of these parallel structures raises a good question. If we can construct a parallel society, do we have any reason to respect and act within the original power structure? Ironically, by respecting the existing power structure and following the rules to a T, you show how banal and ineffectual the rituals are that support such a structure. To assume that the laws are a mere facade, that they have no validity, and that therefore it is pointless to appeal to them would mean to go on reinforcing those aspects of the law that create the facade and the ritual. It would mean confirming the law as an aspect of the world of appearances and enabling those who exploit it to rest easy with the cheapest form of their excuse. Demanding that the laws be upheld is thus an act of living within the truth that threatens the whole mendacious structure at its point of maximum mendacity. Over and over again, such appeals make the purely ritualistic nature of the law clear to society and to those who inhabit its power structures. The list I've provided of ways to live within the truth is not exhaustive. As Havel says, living within the truth covers a vast territory, whose outer limits are vague and difficult to map. A territory full of modest expressions of human volition, the vast majority of which will remain anonymous and whose political impact will probably never be felt or described any more concretely than simply as a part of a social climate or mood. However, by pursuing a life lived in truth, you are not choosing the easy path. You are not without conflict or hardship. You are a dissident fighting for truth. 
You do not become a dissident just because you decide one day to take up this most unusual career. You are thrown into it by your personal sense of responsibility, combined with a complex set of external circumstances. You are cast out of the existing structures and placed in a position of conflict with them. It begins as an attempt to do your work well and ends with being branded an enemy of society. It is up to you whether you choose to live in truth or dwell in lies. It is up to you to decide whether living in the truth is worth the struggle and sacrifice, if the possible outcome from doing so is important and valuable, or if the comfort and security of living in lies is more appealing. But the fact that you have the ability to make that choice demonstrates the power you have as the powerless, a power that structures in place do everything to suppress. There are thousands of nameless people who try to live within the truth, and millions who want to but cannot. Perhaps only because to do so in the circumstances in which they live, they would need ten times the courage of those who have already taken the first step. What would the world look like if people gained that courage to take the first step, and recognized the power of the powerless? The real question, however, is whether the brighter future is really always so distant. What if, on the contrary, it has been here for a long time already, and only our own blindness and weakness has prevented us from seeing it around us and within us, and kept us from developing it? Die!